Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk mainly about um, about how you get um, circuit lower bounds if you that the basically any way of derandomizing um, generic way of derandomizing algorithm is going to give you some kind of circuit lower bound. So last class, we saw, last um, lecture, we saw that any way, uh, or if you've got a, a circuit lower bound, you can use that to give this universal derandomization of algorithms by constructing pseudorandom generators. Um, and here we're going to say that that in some sense this um, the this is necessary. Um, okay, so. Um, and uh, so, but before I, before I talk about that, uh, Valentin and Antonina on the way to, to, to here today pointed out that I sort of was giving a historical talk without really making it relevant to some of the other things, the, the um, you know, giving any kind of directions where we could connect it to the other lines of research. Um, what we'd want to do to update it to to connect to other lines of research um, being discussed. So I thought of like two possible problems, specific problems that we could think about um, that would connect this general question of when can you derandomize algorithms to um, some of the other more general um, issues that have been that have arisen in, in some of the other talks. So one of the thing questions that was asked, uh, I believe, yesterday. Um, after seeing some of the randomized algorithms that solved NP-complete problems exactly, okay, um, were is there a general method for derandomizing uh, such algorithms? Okay. Um, so one way of formalizing what such algorithms is uh, is due to um, to um, Pavel Pudlak and Mohan Paturi. Um, they observe that many of the exact algorithms for the hard problems have the following form. They're actually a polynomial time algorithm, even though we're, we're interested in the exponential, the exact exponential time. But this polynomial time algorithm, so Pavel heard his name, um, ha has only an exponentially small success probability. So we have to repeat it many times, about one in the success probability times, uh, before we're, we're very likely to see one that have one of these runs succeed. And since we actually care about the exact um, exponential complexity, running the algorithm 1 over epsilon times is very different from running the algorithm 1 over epsilon squared times. And for many of the, many of the algorithms that we've seen, 1 over epsilon times is good because it's much less than, exponent, than exhaustive search, whereas 1 over epsilon squared times would be horrible, much worse than naive algorithms. So when we, the challenge in derandomizing such an algorithm is, um, is to try to preserve exactly this, this number, number of, um, uh, the number of repetitions implicit in, in the derandomization. So, um, so we saw that, um, so that, you know, for general derandomization where you don't have this asymmetry between the, the success probability and the time when they're about the same, we could derandomize by constructing a, a pseudorandom generator that took some number of n bits to some number t bits so that um, the problem of um, a half plus epsilon solving the randomness distinguishing prob problem for G was T hard. Okay. So um, in this kind of algorithm, you would get the same thing. So in the general setting, there's symmetry between T and epsilon, and we want to get the number of random bits. You know, the ideal thing would be to get it about log T and log 1 over epsilon, logarithmic and 1 and over epsilon, so that when you do an exhaustive search through all 2 to the n strings, pseudorandom strings, you have overhead that's polynomial in T and polynomial in 1 over epsilon. But in our setting, T is much smaller than epsilon, or 1 over epsilon. 
So the question is, can we have a pseudorandom generator, or under what assumptions can we have a pseudorandom generator, where the seed length could be even close to t, just a little bit less than t, because we're willing to have mildly or sub-exponential overhead in, um, in t, but we want it to be very tight in terms of this epsilon. Okay. So the, we could only afford about one times log one over epsilon. Uh, you know, the dependence on, on epsilon would have to be exactly log one over epsilon, or maybe like one plus little o of one times log one over epsilon. Uh, that, would, that would raise epsilon to some power, but something that would be even small, um, you know, wouldn't diminish the savings by, by um, even a constant factor. So if we had such a construction, I think that would successfully answer the question of, um, you know, of can we de-randomize this broad class of algorithms? Um, and of course, we'll probably have to make, because we're, we're, we show that some, you know, that de-randomization in general um, implies circuit lower bounds, you're going to probably have to make some assumption about some, har some hardness assumption for some function somewhere to get started on this. So I'm saying, can we do this under any reasonable um, circuit complexity assumption? So I'm putting a dollar amount of $200 on this problem. Um, so, uh, so another problem that we talked about on the way here, thing, is um, it's a little bit even more general. Okay, um, so we Ryan talked about um, circuit um, circuit uh, analysis problems, and um, so and how some concrete circuit analysis problems are sort of linked together and linked to lower bounds. So um, in this paper with um, Barack et al., well, many authors um, that introduced some notions of obfuscator before destroying them, um, but has come back because one of our weakest definition, so we proved that these notions of obfuscator were actually impossible except for one that was too weak to do anything, that one has come back and has proved to be very surprisingly useful. Okay. So anyway, so um, one consequence of the strong obfuscators that don't exist would have been this kind of general Rice's theorem for polynomial time computable functions. I want to say, so the, the, the sort of conjecture is that, that the circuit analysis problems are hard. In a, in a formal sense. So what do I mean? So say that we have any property of a function, call it P, and this is probably bad because P stands for polynomial time, but not here, just property. The, fun, the property is white box solvable. If given a circuit C, you can tell whether the function computed by that circuit has property P. And it's black box solvable if using just an oracle for f, the function f, and an upper bound on the size bound. So I mean, like, given a circuit, given any circuit, what, do you, what can you do without even understanding the circuit? You can know that the, the circuit computes a function of, at most, its own size circuit complexity. Okay. So we're also going to give an upper bound on the circuit complexity of this function to the black box algorithm and say, decide, and, and ask it to decide whether the function has, has property p. And the conjecture is that any property that's solvable in the white box setting in polynomial time, so this is kind of a generic circuit analysis problem, this property P, and we're saying that any non-trivial circuit, you know, anything that can be solved black box doesn't really involve in analyzing the circuit. Just says, I'm just going to use the circuit without thinking about it. Something in the white box solvable setting involves looking at the circuit. And so the conjecture is that circuit analysis problems are generally hard, so the only things that are solvable in the white box setting are those that are solvable in the black box setting. Okay, so what I'm asking, 
Okay, so one thing you could do is try to prove this conjecture, if it seems very difficult, it involves as a first step proving P not equal NP, and so on, <laughs> um, because that's a circuit analysis problem. Um, but what I'd like to say is we're saying a generic way of saying circuit analysis is connected to lower bounds is to say if this conjecture is false, if some property is solvable in the black box setting, it's a white box setting that's not solvable in the black box setting, then some kind of circuit lower bound follows. I'm wondering, you know, if, it's, if, it's, if it's black box oracle access, I guess what, what's to stop some nonsense where the circuit behaves like, almost according to the property, but has like is off by one bit at a particular location? Um, that that would not be black box solvable either. Sorry. So that wouldn't be. How do you test whether? Okay. So like, take SAT algorithms, right? They have exactly that property. So SAT is um, saying, is the function identically zero, or is it different from zero at one, one yes. could be random input. And so you know, it's not clear that, that that's ever white box solvable. Okay, thanks. It's clear it's not black box solvable if it could be a random place. Yes? Conjecture is true, then you get a lower bound. If the conjecture is false, then you are asking for a lower bound. Sure, I like to win. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there has to be a quantitative loss, you expect, or like what? How much? Yeah, well, well. So also, um, is that we have a lot of other win-win. You know, well, win or or if you're 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 not rooting for lower bounds, lose lose. <laughs> Right, because we're saying, say, like, take de-randomization. Either de-randomization is hard, or I'm going to show you, you get a circuit lower bound. Unfortunately, the hardness is for a uniform model, and the lower bound is for a non-uniform model, and so you can't just say you get a lower bound. Um, and again, here I'd be like talking about uniform white box versus. So, yeah. um, but, you know, if some version gives you a win-win argument that gives you a lower bound, then I will up the, the, up the price for the, the award. <laughs> okay? So, um, so this I'll also give, um, like, offer $200 for it, but, um, so up to two hundred dollars because it's kind of vague, <laughs> and it's going to be judged whether it's worth the full two hundred dollars. Going to be judged by a committee, <laughs> where the, the 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 membership of the committee is Valentin. <laughs> or did Valentin himself solve the problem? <laughs> then I think he'll give himself the full prize. <laughs> That would be my conjecture. <laughs> okay. So, um, is a, is a, like the general statement? And it's a little bit vague because they like some kind of circuit lower bound follows, some kind of lower bound follows. Um, but it, is the statement of the problem is clear? Yeah. Are you going to explain how the lower bounds follow? What? This, Your bottom line. These are problems that I'm offering money for, okay. not things I know how to do. The blue statement is the question. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was a It's not, yes. Yeah, so. yeah, I thought the price. Oh, uh, uh, okay. So if you. For the red statement, you don't need no dollar incentive, I guess. All right. So, um, yeah. Of course, if you could somehow prove the negation of this uh, as well, but that, I'm not quite sure how you would do that without proving upper bounds, you know, for everything that we could imagine. <laughs> so, 
questions. This is very vague. <laughs> yes. So the, red, the red conjecture is in the is described in the Barack et al. paper. Yeah. And that's worth a million dollars. But but you're. Well, it's, oh, it's worth a million dollar. Well, if you prove the conjecture, if you disprove the conjecture, so it's worth. Cons <laughs> right. So the my. Oh, I mean. Yeah, so the blue part is worth up to two hundred dollars. That's why it's in blue. <laughs> yeah. And this whole thing is in blue. <laughs> so white box solvable is this for any representation of the circuit? Because there's like some that are more uh, so he, so here I'm asking for general representations of a circuit. But um, say so Antonina is working on like subclasses of circuits, so the general question is interesting for subclasses of circuits as well, special forms of circuit. Um, and if you prove it, if you prove it for some subclass of circuits rather than for general circuits, uh, it'll be up to the committee to decide your reward. <laughs> Um, so any questions about about these? And I'll go on to something fairly different. Just to make sure, so in the black block solvable, you said that it's, it's p-time, if it's p-time in, in S. P-time, yeah, so S is given in unary, yeah. I should say. So p-time in N, the number of inputs to the function in S. Decide whether it has that property. Is that saying given any C that computes? That's it? right. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be able to decide it for an arbitrary C, not the best case C. Yeah. So like, yeah. There are ways to there are ways to make you know the function that just says the all zero function easy to see that it's all zero, and ways to make it hard to see that it's all zero. we saw a couple of results like um, one from from BFNW if say X is not in P slash poly then um, then the circuit approximation value approximation problem um, is in time infinitely often uh, due to the n to the epsilon for every epsilon. Okay, so you know sub exponential derandomization of this problem that can actually code every every kind of probabilistic decision uh, problem Pro decision problem for probabilistic algorithms. Okay, so. Um, so what I want to show you today, so that says if we've got a, a strong enough non-uniform lower bound, then we get a derandomization. Okay. And we said that's kind of this kind of intuitive connection uh, because this derandomization de problem is a kind of meta problem. And so trying, you know, the intuition is that its input is a circuit and that circuit is trying to distinguish its random tape from pseudorandom tape. From pseudo randomness. Um, so um, today I want to I want to show a version of a result from IKW. IKW gives quantitatively stronger results. I'm going to show like the easy version and uh, saying something like we get an implication in the other direction. So let's say that cap. Now I'm just going to say if cap is in polynomial time, then we'll get a lower bound, uh, not quite for x, but for one class above x. 
so it doesn't have polynomial size circuits. Um, so I guess when I was, again, like on the way to, to breakfast, so I like to explain what's going on in this kind of result. Because, um, so Valentin was saying, well, what if people, you know, don't care about non-uniform complexity, they just care about uniform complexity. And what this result was saying, he said, even if all you care about is, or if all you think you care about is, is uniform kinds of complexity, like probabilistic algorithms and deterministic algorithms, you actually have to think about non-uniform complexity. So you can't pick that apart. So saying like, it's, like a, it's a special case of a, of a general, my, my general philosophy of mathematics is that mathematics is like a bowl of spaghetti. Okay. So, you know, you're interested in one noodle, <laughs> but before, you know, if you start like slurping that one noodle, <laughs> you're going to be having a tour of the whole bowl. <laughs> And everything else, you know, someone else is trying to understand another noodle, they're going to intersect at some point. <laughs> and maybe be stuck together. <laughs> okay? So this is saying, like, at least for complexity, the uniform classes and the non uniform classes are strands of noodle that at least at some point are stuck together. And I think this, seeing this, um, seeing these surprising connections is, is a lot. Uh, uh, what this what this um, this whole semester is about? Okay, so um, okay now the proof when I get to the proof is going to be so it's really going to be fairly straightforward. The hard part there are going to be two hard parts uh, to understanding this proof. One is after I show it to you, you're going to say, "Wait, that's all." and not believe I'm done, I think. <laughs> okay. The other hard part is that uh, if you're not familiar with complexity, um, it's going to involve a large number of complexity classes. So I'm just going to review. They're, they're not like the world's most obscure complexity classes, but there are a fair number of them. Okay. So I just drew a picture of the different complexity classes that were, some of which we'll have to talk about, but like the um, the full picture is, you know, we have polynomial time. Then, you know, above polynomial time are things like NP and co-NP, and you can look at NP intersect co-NP. Okay. Then you start getting the polynomial hierarchy, P to the NP, the second level of the polynomial hierarchy that involves two two alternations of quantifiers. There exists something, you know, NP is there exists something that you can verify in polynomial time. Sigma 2p is there exists something so that for all some other things, something you can verify in polynomial time. Sigma 3 has three quantifiers, and so on. The polynomial hierarchy is any number of, any fixed number of quantifiers. It's the limit. Then all of that's contained in exponential time, and at exponential time level, the whole pattern repeats itself. Okay? You have nx intersect co nx, nx, x to the np. Um, is corresponds to p to the np, um, and then the exponential hierarchy, and all of that's contained in double exponential time. So, um, so, um, okay. So, so that's just like a reminder to us that all these classes exist. Okay. Yes. A CAPP is the circuit approximation, prob approximate probability problem. So that's given a circuit, um, estimate how, what fraction of inputs um, does the circuit accept up to some additive error. And the, that's a sort of a complete problem for BPP, actually a little bit more promise BPP um, because we don't insist that, you know, that we do anything, um, that we always have um, bounded error. It's just that if we could do this, we can say when there is bounded error, then, then we, our approximation is informative. If the approximation is like 0.49, we, 
we really don't know whether the algorithm usually accepts or usually rejects. Um, okay. So, um, so this is a, still like a, you know, we had a kind of jujitsu in proving this. We're going to need a different kind of jujitsu in proving this because we're starting with an algorithm and we're getting an impossibility result. So how can we, how can we use uh, an easiness property to get a hardness property? Um, so, and then the other thing is we have to do, the other thing that's a little tricky about the statement, even in the statement, is we start with a uniform assumption and we work our way to a non-uniform assumption. So I'm going to show you, actually there's two very classical um, types of argument that we're going to, and we're going to use versions of this that have been a little bit updated um, to, to prove this result. Um, and the first one I'm going to say is in a general argument for shifting uh, from the non-uniform model to a uniform model, from connections between non-uniform complexity and uniform complexity. So one of the first places where those two strands of spaghetti meet. This is... Um, Actually, uh, so back in like the early 80s, maybe 70s, in the paper that introduced the, the notion of, of the complexity of, you know, introdu reintroduce circuit complexity into complexity, into what we think of as complexity. So it's a, it's a theorem of Myers um, that he refused to publish and so it was in a paper by Karp and Lipton. And the, the theorem said, says that if, if X is in P slash poly, then in fact it's in um, the second level of the polynomial time hierarchy. So if we get a if we get a non-uniform co containment for X, then in this picture, everything between here and here collapses. And so you can actually say X, because it's already known that this is contained in it, it's equivalent to say it's equal. And um, I'm going to give a, a slightly different a slightly leading proof. Hopefully, it'll be helpful to um, to Ryan's work today, later today, to understanding what Ryan is doing later today as well. Okay. So um, the the first step is to just look at um, something about exponential time. Okay. When we run an, and I'm not going to give the full details of this of this lemma. It's sort of like a standard thing looking, you know, you have to like actually like um, talk about machine models. Um, but, uh, but if you think about it intuitively, you know, when we run an algorithm, every algorithm we run is eventually translated into Boolean operations. And the way we translate an algorithm into Boolean operations is very uh, systematic. There isn't like a huge, you know, an algorithm doesn't have huge gaps where uh, of intuition or imagination. That's what makes it an algorithm. So you can pretty much guess in advance what's going to happen in step T in terms of what's happened in previous steps. So, um, so a, a uniform circuit representation. So, you know, a circuit has its n inputs and then m gates, and each gate is some kind of Boolean operation of uh, at most, uh, say, two previously computed gates. Actually, I'm going to start the labeling of the gates thing. Like the first end gates, I'm going to think of as the input. 
so that this is this makes sense even when we're doing operations on the input. Okay, and um, we'll make it uniform if if there's an algorithm A um, that runs in polynomial time. In it says like given i, it returns um, i one, i two, and um, what the two inputs to the gate are and what the operation is. Okay. So, um, so the, the lemma is that, and this is kind of like tedious, but not tedious to, to go through in different machine models, but not so hard to prove, is that every problem in X has an exponential size um, P uniform circuit. So there's going to be exponentially many gates because that's how much time the algorithm, you know, the the problem takes to solve. But each gate is going to be easy to tell you in, in advance what it does, just given the name of the gate. And when I say polynomial. Remember, if, if m is exponential, that means the names of gates are polynomial in length. And so i itself is going to be a polynomial length string. So when I say polynomial time, I really mean polynomial time in the input size. And you can scale this down for other complexities other than x. But for x, it's, a, it's fairly nice because it exactly uh, matches polynomial time. Okay. So I think this is very believable, if, even though if it would be like tedious to to prove. Okay. So now I'm going to prove this Meyer translation just using this lemma, and it actually is um, is uh, is almost immediate. Okay. Okay. Well, note that computing, you know, computing each gate is also an exponential time. So in, in addition to saying what the, what the circuit is going to do on x1 through xn, at the end, the last gate, it's exponent, you know, the exponential time algorithm also computes the value of every gate. So, um, Assume x is in p slash poly, then, um, then the you know, and we have some some l and l and x. Then um, there's this uh, a circuit, you know, uniform circuit. For deciding L and computing the value of the ith gate is also solvable in X. So what we're going to do, so there because X is in P slash poly, there should be a circuit, small circuit, that given X and I tells you the, the value of the ith gate. So we're going to non-deterministically guess a polynomial size circuit C that given X and I computes the value of the ith gate on input X uh, according to these rules. Well, but then, how do we know that that circuit actually works? Okay. Um, well, we can't really know that it works, but we could certainly know that it fails. Because each GI is supposed to be op i of GI1, GI2. So um, if it fails, it's going to fail at some gate. 
So co-nondeterministically, S and I, you know, compute because the circuit is very uniform, we can compute the I1, the I2, and the OPI and verify that um, C of XI, in this case we're looking for a counterexample, so we want to verify that it's different from op i of c of x i1, c of x i2. Okay. So if it, if it messes up, if the circuit messes up on x, it has to mix up on some gate. And so we co non so guess which gate it messes up on and verify that it messes up on that gate. If it never messes up, then the circuit was correct, and so the value it gives us on x is, is actually the correct answer, or on xm is actually the correct answer. And if you look at it, here we have, we're non-determinously guessing c, existentially guessing c, co-non-determinously guessing the gate that it messes up in. Both of these have polynomial size descriptions, and then doing a procedure that takes polynomial time. So that's exactly the definition of the second level of the polynomial time hierarchy, which is where we want to put it. Okay, okay. so um, before I go on, let me just tell you one um, uh, one modern update for this that just gives you a slightly better conclusion, okay. but very similar. Okay. In the modern update is to say, okay, let's take this very uniform s circuit and, you know, this is a very, you know, what we're doing is like coding, when we're doing this, spelling this out, we're writing it as a big 3C and F. It's the same as the reduction from circuit SAT to 3C and F SAT. Okay, and I want to like be a little bit more lenient about this for all quantifier. And so what I'm going to do is take this circuit, this uniform circuit, and I'm going to run it through the PCP construction. And in fact, actually doing it in this context, in the exponential time context, was actually done before the PCP theorem was actually proved. So use the proto PCP of, say, Babai, Fortnow, and Lund, we can, um, we can rewrite it as um, ver this verification process um, so that, um, you know, we're adding more checks But making sure that that if any check fails, that a constant fraction of checks fail. So saying like take this, write it as a three CNF, run the three CNF through the PCP theorem or any previous version of the PCP theorem that you, that you feel like, then, um, then what, we, what we get is that instead of like having to look through all the circuits here, do a exhaustive search, have a, a for all quantifier here, we can just randomly sample gates of the circuit and most of them are, many of them are gonna fail. Okay. So that makes it a, a non-deterministic um, guess here, but then a random verification here, and actually puts it in, means that we actually have to add a slightly, um, add one more class to our diagram, Merlin Arthur, the class of things that are, uh, have a certificate 
that's probabilistically verifiable. Okay, and so the update. I'm not really sure who this is, who to attribute this to, is that if x is in p, p slash poly, actually this was in BFNW, wasn't it? Yeah. That this means that um, x is actually uh, not just in sigma two, but is in a subclass between NP and sigma two, and seemingly closer to NP, Merlin Arthur. So that just makes the, the result uh, just a little bit stronger, but in a way that's really useful. Okay. And what, what, what's really useful about this is that one of these quantifiers now involves randomness, and we're going to be using an assumption that allows us to remove randomness. Okay. So this is one ingredient, and this is the ingredient where we're shifting from a non-uniform assumption to a uniform conclusion. And even better, a uniform conclusion involving randomness. Okay. So let me give you the other kind of ingredient. It also goes back, way, way, way back, um, to when, uh, you know, when at least to when uh, Western complexity theorists were first studying circuit complexity, as, which you know in the Eastern Bloc it never stopped. Um, Um, okay, uh, and, and it's a kind of logically tricky kind of argument, but it sort of makes sense. And I call it the, the shelf collapsing argument. So it isn't quite true that we have no lower bounds for circuits. What we have are lower bounds for circuits that are way, way up here in this hierarchy, and we'd like to move them lower in the hierarchy. So the shelf collapse method is a way of moving results that, you know, hardness results that you know for things way up in the hierarchy, lower in the hierarchy. And there's like unconditional shelf collapsing results and, um, and conditional shelf collapsing results. I'm going to see some of both. So what, the way I view it is we have this kind of, in, the, in a room that we can't quite see into, there's a bookcase. Okay? And uh, on the top shelf of the bookcase, we see that there is a very heavy object. Okay? And we can't quite see the lower half of the bookcase. But... Um, but um, we're going to argue that there's a heavy object lower in the bookcase. So, and the way we're going to argue it is to say either one of two cases. Okay? Either there's a pretty heavy object lower in the bookcase, and we're done. Or there's nothing in the, in the lower shelf of the bookcase. That bookcase shelf is not very strong. <laughs> we have a heavy object up here, so the bookcase, the shelf has got to, got to give. <laughs> and then the heavy object will fall into the lower shelf. So either there's something already there, or there soon will be something there. <laughs> okay? And so that's, that's the whole argument. Okay. So, um, so I think like the first prototypical uh, shelf collapsing argument was due to Ravi Kanan, who's around here somewhere, um, in general, I mean. Um, saw him yesterday. Uh, and it says, uh, it shows that, um, it's an unconditional shelf collapsing argument. It shows that sigma 2x is not contained in p slash poly. There, there are a couple of other things in his, in his paper. Okay, and the, maybe he cared about more. Um, and this is again, it's like from the early 80s, I think. I don't remember exactly. Okay, and here was his argument. Okay. The first thing he did was say, well, we know um, 
this is an even more classical result. Reardon and, and Shannon showed there exists a function f on n bits so that the size of f is this exponential, 2 to the n over n, well, uh, omega. I guess there's like some fixed constant. Sorry, they call it back to me. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay, sorry. So I'll say it again. There's this classical result of Reardon and Shannon <laughs> to say there exists a function f. Is this better? Yeah. So that the, si the minimal size of f is on the order of 2 to the n over n. And you know, they, they pinned it down very precisely. For, for us, all that's important is that there, are function there exist functions by accounting argument that take exponential circuit complexity. Okay. So, um, so Kanan's first argument involves saying, um, what is the value of the first, in the lexicographical sense, uh, maximal hardness function on x? So you look for all functions on two to the on n bits. You can express them as truth tables of size two to the n. You look to see for each one. You by exhaustive search look through all circuits that might be computing them. See whether the circuit actually computes them. Isolate their complexity. Take the one of maximal complexity, which is two to the n over n, and evaluate. Take the you know there are many of them that have that complexity. Take the first one in lexicographic order and um, evaluate it on x. And if you like go through all of this, it actually involves a number of quantifiers, each of which is exponentially long, but it's a fixed number of quantifiers. Um, and so you can show that this, and it's this certainly, you know, what we're, we're having in name, is this, this is actually like the, you know, the function this is computing by another name is this first lexicographically hard, first hard function, which by definition is hard. The first hard function is hard. Um, so, um, so, so this um, is a hard function, and if you look through the logical structure, it's really just in like sigma 3, I should say sigma sub 3, in the exponential time hierarchy. So this hard function is up near the top of our diagram. But he promised us a hard function slightly lower. Okay, so how does he do this? Well, by the shelf collapse argument. So the the top shelf is sigma three uh, x, and we know there's a really hard function up in sigma three x. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the shelf that we can't see is going to be x. Okay. And somehow he's reasoning about sigma 2x. Okay. But what we're going to show is that there, if, it, if there isn't a weight here to keep the whole shelf up, we get a, the, the shelf breaks at this level. So, you know, the one above it, the one below it, the downstairs neighbor, is sigma 2x. So, um, so why is this true? Well, he says uh, either x is in p slash poly or not. That's pretty clear. Not saying a lot. But um, what, what uh, Meyer already showed is that if x is in p slash poly, then x equals uh, sigma 2p, and if you translate that up, so you know we get this collapse all the way down here. If you the, that um, by a padding argument gives you the same collapse, the analogous collapse up here. So that means all of this collapses down to sigma 2x, and sigma 3x is in the middle there. So um, it follows that sigma 3x equals sigma 2x. 
and we know the sigma. So the, that means the ceiling collapses on, on sigma two x, and the heavy thing falls into the into the sigma two's apartment. Okay. So um, so if if it is in p slash poly, the shelf collapses. Well, it might not be in p slash poly though. That's, it's actually probably not in p slash poly. But what do we know if it's not in p slash poly? Then we've got something hard way down here, and that's contained in this. Okay. Then, uh, then, uh, certainly, sigma two x is not contained. So either way, uh, Kanan wins, and as uh, you know, so I like win-win arguments <laughs> that give you lower bounds, <laughs> um, and want more of them, not trying to avoid them. Okay. So and say like it's really easy, but logically strange, because here we're saying we either win or we win. But we don't know whether we, which one, which way we win. <laughs> so we're going to follow the the same kind of model in the randomness setting. Okay. So what did we want to show? Uh, so we wanted to show that. Um, so what was our, the claim that? The, Um, okay. Uh, I'm really almost done. So we, we're claiming that. Okay, I'm almost done, and I'm actually almost out of time. I've, those two are coincidental. <laughs> uh, that if. Um, CAPP is contained in um, P is is in P. Then we get N X intersect co N X is not contained in P slash poly. And we're going to use the same kind of win win shelf collapsing argument. Okay. And with the same kind of down base of the, the of the of the apartment building. Okay. So um, so first we'll assume that C A P P is in uh, P. And one, you know, that means that we can solve any kind of derandomization problem, and in particular that part about verifying certificates for things. It is in and is in, it can be done in polynomial time. So it follows from this that M A is actually equal to N P. Okay. Um, so if in addition, if X is in P slash poly, and again this is one case, it's either there or it's not. Okay. If X was in P slash poly, we said then x uh, equals m a, and actually I'm now going to say one other condition. x is closed under complement, so it's also equal to co m a, uh, and so it's equal to m a intersect co m a. And then we already said that m a is just now another because cap is easy. M a is just another name for n p. So this is n p intersect co n p. So now we get a collapse all the way. With this assumption, we get the collapse if x is easy all the way down to np intersect co np. Okay. Well, that means you know everything in the middle, like sigma three p, collapses down to np intersect co np. And that when we translate up, you know, we get like x x equals sigma three x 
equals uh, n x intersect co n x. Um, and so in particular, n x intersect co n x, so that means this hard problem dropped all the way down to just above x to n x intersect co n x. Okay. So, and this is, has, has very hard problems. Okay, so that's if x, you know, under the unlikely event that x is contained in p slash poly, then we get a circuit lower bound. We moved our known circuit lower bound all the way down to nx intersect colon x. Okay. But what if x is not in p slash poly? It answers itself. If x is not in p slash poly, then x is not in p slash poly. <laughs> <laughs> and in particular, nx intersect colon x is not in p slash poly. So we get the same consequence either way. Okay. Now, we could do a lot more work than we did to try to get quantitative versions that, that, are, are, that are tighter. So, you know, assuming CAP has a sub-exponential algorithm, what, do you, what kind of consequence do you get? Assuming, uh, can we get, um, you know, assuming it's in polynomial time, can we get a better circuit lower bound than just super polynomial? So, there's more work to be done, but this is the basic idea. And uh, the bell roll tolls. I'm actually going to talk about, so this is not how we proved it originally. We proved it originally using something called the easy witness lemma, which is something like a search versus decision uh, lemma for non-uniform complexity for NX. Um, and uh, it, so we no longer sort of like use the easy, we no longer need the easy witness lemma for many of the de-randomization connections, but actually it comes up again uh, in Ryan's work relating SAT algorithms to, um, to lower bounds. So I'm going to talk about sort of um, a, a lemma that we thought was really interesting, got orphaned tempor temporarily, and then got adopted by Ryan. The significance of sigma 2x as the, you know, in this proof is that on the one hand it's between x and sigma 3 to x. Yeah. On the other hand, it's like um, the least class that we know how to sort of diagonalize against sigma 2p. Is that well, so the, the smallest class that we know how to diagonalize is really like sigma 3. And we're moving it down, and Kanan moved it down to sigma 2 by this logical twist of. Right, but in the case where, I mean, you have these. So, and I should say, you know, that um, that by you know by using this modern version using the PCP theorem, you can actually move it down a little further to things like MAX. And that was done by Fortnow and Santanan, or am I getting the co-author wrong? And, and it's been I think it's even been moved down just a, a slight amount, something like to BPP to the BPX to the NP or something like this. But there was just one part of the argument you didn't write down, which is suppose that X is in P slash poly. Yeah. X equals sigma 2P. Right. And then, and then you conclude that uh, that is not equal to sigma 2X because of uh, time hierarchy theorem for. Right? Oh, so you could try to do it that way? Yeah. Um, so, and that's. Yes, that would. That's. In fact, how we using time hierarchy theorems, not for sigma two, but for um, for non. So like sigma. Two, so the thing is, then you have to sigma two is a non-deterministic class. It's like NP to the NP. So you have to use the variant of um, non-deterministic time hierarchy theorems that are actually significantly more complex than the deterministic time hierarchy theorems. So um, 
So you can do it that way, uh, but n probably not in 10 minutes. I was just trying to understand the, the argument that you were sketching. Now. Yeah. No, the argument I'm sketching is much simpler. It's just straightforward. We don't need to use the time hierarchy theorem at all. We just know there's a hard problem in sigma 3x. And we know that if there is no hard problem in sigma 2x, in sigma, in uh, x, then sigma 2, 3x and sigma 2x are just different names for the same class. Because the, the polynomial time hierarchy collapses? And because the polynomial time hierarchy collapses and, and rescaling gives you the exponential time hierarchy collapse. So I, I slurred over that one detail, but it's actually pretty standard and pretty easy. Yes. Uh, later on, you made it specialized. The assumption was kind of like, uh, let's say simplified. You say a uh, polynomial identity testing is in. That's Friday, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask if you're going to say something about that. Friday, I will. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs>